Hello and welcome to Lamplighter. Today is March 26. As we continue in our daily Bible reading, we're now moving into a period of historical transition. We've been talking over the last several days about how the nation of Israel has been going through a cycle. They fall into sin. They are led into oppression by God himself. He takes one of the neighboring nations and brings them in to oppress the Israelites. And finally, when the Israelites are burdened enough and in enough misery, they recognize the error of their ways. They cry out to God for deliverance. God hears their prayer and he sends to them a judge or a leader. As long as this leader is leading them, everything seems to be going well and they are at peace. But when this leader dies, Israel falls back into sin and the cycle repeats itself. We've seen this happen throughout our study of the book of Judges. And now, as we continue to transition, I want us to see the bigger picture. I want us to take a big step back and see that now what's happening historically is that the people of Israel are transitioning from what we've been calling a theocracy that is governed by, ruled by God, into a monarchy where they're going to have a king for the first time because they desire to be like the nations around them. Now, remember, God is not going to be surprised by this because back when we were reading the laws, even when that reading got somewhat tedious, we read some laws being given by God about how to deal with the king and some of the things the king was going to demand of his people. God knew the day was coming when his people would cry out for a king, and this day is finally here. So we're transitioning from judges to kings, and Samuel is kind of the key role player in between this transition, because Samuel himself represents the last of the judges, and Samuel himself is also a prophet or a representative of God, and as this prophet, he is going to be the one who actually anoints the first kings of Israel. And so there's a 465-year period of kings that's about to unfold. And in our Bibles, we read about this whole period in the books of First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, and First and Second Chronicles. Now, while we're taking this step back, I want to give us a general overview of where the history is taking us. Under this new kingship, Israel is going to, for a while, be a united kingdom. There is going to be 40 years of rule by three different kings in this united kingdom. But then the day will come when the unity is dissolved and the kingdom divides. There will be 10 tribes that are in the north, two tribes that are in the south. And then, because of their sin and rebellion, first the northern tribes ultimately the southern tribes, will be carried away into captivity by foreign nations as their discipline, their punishment for their rebellion and sin. All of that is yet to come. But as we zero back in and see how this is beginning to unfold in our daily reading, we're introduced to a woman by the name of Hannah. Hannah is a wonderful woman who is very dedicated to God, but when we're introduced to her, she is very bitter. She is very sad because she is barren. This is not an unusual account. We've seen several barren women prior to Hannah, but Hannah is one who wants desperately to have a child and specifically to have a son, and she makes a promise to God. As she's praying in the tabernacle one day while she's there to worship, she makes a vow to God that if God will open her womb and give her a son, she will dedicate him to the Lord. Now, the priest of the tabernacle at the time is a man by the name of Eli. Eli sees Hannah praying. He sees her lips moving but doesn't hear anything and automatically assumes that she's drunk. What kind of man of God would assume such a thing? Well, as we get to know Eli, we'll see that that's really not much of a surprise. Hannah continues to mourn her barrenness. She prays and makes this vow to God, and ultimately God hears her. He opens her womb, and Samuel is born. 
Samuel is then dedicated to God, just as Hannah promised. And by the way, she names him Samuel, and the word or the name Samuel literally means heard of God. She remembers the vow. She recognizes God as the giver of all things. And remember, this shouldn't surprise us because the story is about God. It's not about Hannah, nor about Eli, or even about Samuel. The story is about God. God hears her. God opens her womb, and she gives her child to God. Now, this is important because Eli's own sons are wicked. They have no regard for the Lord. They treat the Lord's offerings with contempt, we're told. And Eli then is looking to see what's going to happen ultimately to the leadership of the tabernacle as Hannah is dedicating her son Samuel to serve there. Eli blesses Elkanah and Hannah, that's Samuel's parents, and as a result of this blessing, and more importantly as a result of God's blessing, Elkanah and Hannah together have more children after Samuel, three sons and two daughters as a matter of fact. Eli understands that his own sons are wicked. He rebukes them, but they refuse to listen. And then we're told something kind of interesting. It is the Lord's will to put them to death. Then we're told that Samuel grows in stature and in favor with God and man, a very reminiscent description that's later used of the Lord Jesus as a young boy. He grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man, according to Luke chapter 2, verse 52. Now there's a man of God who comes to Eli and to Eli's house and pronounces a judgment upon them. This man of God comes to Eli and says, there'll be no old men in their family line. And God says this through the man of God, those who honor me, I will honor. But those who do not honor me will be despised. They will be disciplined. It's always been true. As a matter of fact, remember what kept Moses from the promised land. He missed an opportunity to honor God as holy in the presence of the Israelites. Again, the man of God says to Eli, those who honor me, I will honor. That's a key statement because it describes what God has been driving out, not only in individually with his people, but with a nation of people to honor him as holy and to be a holy people. And by the way, that's still God's message today. He still expects you and me to honor him as holy. How do we do that? We live holy lives. We live distinctive from the world around us. We praise him with our lives and we give him glory and God will bless us. That has always been the formula, and God is always faithful to it, and he's faithful to us. Isn't it great to be a lamplighter? His word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. I hope you have a blessed day.